Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is James McReynolds. I'm the head of public programs at the Bullock Museum. The Bullock Museum remains closed, but when we reopen, guests will be able to see an exhibition titled This Light of Ours, which features over 150 pictures from activist photographers during the civil rights movement. The images tell a story about the struggle against racial segregation in the South. There's also a portion of the exhibit that features over a dozen images from protest and activism in Austin's own local history. So please come back and check out the exhibit out when we reopen. And for our discussion here today, we're gonna to focus on the relationship between activism and politics in Texas history. Uh, even though Texas is a solidly red state today, we'll hear about how activists and democratic organizers shaped politics in the state during the civil rights era. Uh, I'm lucky to be joined today by Dr. Max Krokmal for this discussion. Dr. Max, as his students call him, is an associate professor of history and the founding chair of the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texas Christian University. Uh, he's the author of the award-winning book, Blue Texas, The Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era. Dr. Brockwell, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, just to set the stage for us, can you give us a big picture idea of what was going on in Texas in the years you write about in the book? Sure. So the book begins in the 1930s, and uh, Texas is very much in a state of transition. Uh, you know, prior to the discovery of oil at Spindletop, uh, Texas was a primarily agricultural state. Um, it didn't become more industrial really until after the 1930 uh, 30s and into the 40s. And so we see a moment of urbanization uh, taking place. Um, and uh, I guess along with that, the, the major changes I'm interested in is that at the turn of the century, uh, we see the installation of new racial caste systems in Texas, the creation of Jim Crow, right, which wasn't uh, just born immediately after the Civil War, but rather had to be invented in the 1890s and at the turn of the century. Uh, there was the Terrell election laws that, that produced the poll tax and other forms of disfranchisement. Uh, so uh, there, and then and then Jim Crow comes to the cities right with urbanization. So there's the creating of of uh, segregated landscapes in our in our communities. Um, there's all the other Jim Crow laws that emerge right around um, around voting, but also far beyond that, schools and so on. Uh, and then of course there's the employment practices that reserve the best jobs for white workers. So there's that happening. There's also a parallel caste system that I call Juan Crow. Uh, and this emerges coming at the same moment, really, as Anglo settlers move into South Texas and transform it into an export agricultural economy. They create a new racial regime that then also is carried back into the cities of the state. So by the 1930s, there's these new racial regimes growing in these growing cities. There's also, of course, the Great Depression. Uh, eventually, by, by, the, by the late 30s and into the 40s, the coming of World War II. Um, and, and, and politically, um, there, there's uh, tension between the powers that be in Texas, the, the group of bourbon Democrats from the countryside and in the cities who had really succeeded at overthrowing Reconstruction and creating these new racial regimes, uh, both in East Texas and South Texas and in the cities. They're essentially conservative uh, Democrats. Um, by the 40s, they're calling themselves Dixiecrats and uh, they support segregation, and they uh, essentially are trying to build a Texas that is um, pro-business, uh, and a, a Texas that is you know, um, very much controlled by economic elites, white economic elites. And on the other hand, you have the reformers of, of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And um, of course, Roosevelt responds to the economic emergency by trying to shift some power into the hands of workers, by trying to regulate uh, unfettered capitalism in America. And in Texas, um, there's a group of, of self-identified liberals, they call themselves independent liberals, or, and mostly white folks who see it as their goal to bring the New Deal reforms to the South, to Texas, to create a more robust welfare state, to take care of people when they're in need of support, um, to regulate the worst excesses of capitalism, and they also, I think, had some interest in a, a gradual easing of Jim Crow, uh, as they understood it, along with other Southern white racial liberals, right? They understood it as an evil, but is also something that they had to accept. And parallel to that, there are African Americans and Mexican Americans who are increasingly challenging uh, the systems of Jim Crow and Juan Crow, as well as the economic elements of that, the lack of a safety net, that particularly 
hit Black and Latinx communities much harder, um, and and also the domination by economic elites. So we see earliest in the book uh, the pecan shellers of San Antonio, uh, a group of Mexicano workers who are basically seasonal agricultural migrants, but with deep ties to uh, uh, well, some of them deeper ties to Texas, some of them more recent migrants uh, following the revolution. Um, and they, uh, they, in 1938, go on strike against the entire pecan shelling industry of San Antonio. And they articulate a vision for the strike that marries economic issues to larger concerns around racial justice. Around the same time, African Americans in Houston and other places are also organizing uh, in Dallas and beyond. Um, in Houston, there's a particularly strong uh, black working class movement uh, that is rooted within both uh, organized labor and the NAACP. Uh, and they articulate, again, a vision of, of um, what scholars have come to call civil rights unionism, uh, a form of activism that connects uh, racial justice with economic issues and with the broad push for a, a social safety net that will extend to everybody. So they become fierce proponents of a permanent fair employment practice commission, to take one example. Right, to fight the, the embedded tradition of segregation in industry. They also fight for and win the right to vote. But, uh, but those are some of the different issues, right? So fighting Jim Crow, fighting Quan Crow, and fighting for uh, labor rights, um, working people, and then uh, for trying to bring the New Deal liberal reforms to Texas and the South. Great. So those are a lot of important issues, obviously, that are motivating people to get get out, um, get together, and, and and fight for stuff. Um, you mentioned some of the to people that were that were part of the coalition. Can you maybe expand upon exactly what those groups were in the Democratic coalition, and, and why did they choose the Democratic Party? Yeah, sure. So, um, okay, so we're jumping ahead a little bit, right? The title of the book talks about this coalition that evolves. It really takes off in in the 1960s. But the book begins in the 30s with some of the, the earliest roots, looking at some of the key players who ultimately do form a political alliance. So it begins, as I said, in the 30s and 40s. The pecan sheller strike in San Antonio uh, has a permanent impact in terms of um, helping uh, Mexican Americans in that city kind of raise their voice and realize their own power. Um, it brings labor activists to the state from other places who, who dig in and, and stick around for a long time. In, in Houston, um, one key character in the book, one key protagonist is a man named Mr. Moses Leroy and his wife, Mrs. Irma Leroy. Uh, they're a really remarkable story, um, but they, they, they really exist across the whole span of the book and even earlier. I mean, Mr. Leroy was in Houston when the Camp Logan riot happened during World War I. Uh, he witnessed it, right? Um, but he had a job working on the railroads, the Southern Pacific, as a black man, he was confined to dirty, low wage, high risk labor. He had no chance of promotion. Um, his union was, was itself segregated and he was kind of relegated into a black, all black auxiliary of the union. Um, but within that context was able to build power, right? And use that auxiliary as a jumping off point for organizing in the community. He, he joins the local chapter of the NAACP that's led by famously by Mrs. Lulu White. And, um, and that chapter just balloons during World War II. Um, they, uh, they organize a series of different campaigns. Uh, as I mentioned before, they, they, they work together to win the right to vote. African-Americans, of course, have been disfranchised by the poll tax, but also by uh, a series of other measures, including in Texas, the white Democratic primary. There was this fiction that if, uh, if the Democratic Party was a private club, rather than a public entity. And this was a way in which the, the white Democratic Party got around um, the 15th Amendment, right? That guaranteed the right to vote after the Civil War. Uh, so activists in Houston led the charge against the white primary. There had been one earlier case coming out of El Paso, but really it, it picks up steam in the 30s and 40s with the, this group of civil rights unionists in Houston going out and collecting donations of a nickel and a dime on the street corners, uh, uh, outside the factory gates, uh, passing the hat at church, um, uh, you know, building up the chapter of the NAACP. By the middle of World War II, Houston had the second largest NAACP chapter in America, uh, second after only Detroit, another industrial center. Uh, 
And uh, so uh, people like Mr. Leroy came together, they did this work, um, and they were able to recruit plaintiffs. And ultimately, a dentist in Houston who was part of the chapter named Lonnie Smith sues the state of Texas, uh, the white, white Democratic Party rather, and establishes that it is in fact subject to uh, oversight by the state, that they can't restrict participation to white voters only. And so the case goes all the way to Supreme Court and is decided in their favor in 1944. Um, another member of this NAACP branch was a postal worker who was a member of an all-black union called the National Alliance of Postal Employees, uh, which was also founded um, with leadership from Houston a, ge a generation earlier. And uh, this gentleman was part of the NAACP branch. Uh, he, he discovered that he was um, unable to get a promotion at, at the post office because of the color of his skin. He ultimately uh, applied to law school and uh, tried to go to the University of Texas and was rejected. So his name was Heman Sweat, and he brought the case against the University of Texas Law School that ultimately desegregated higher education and laid the key precedent for the Brown decision four years later. So, um, you know, this Houston branch was vibrant uh, and dynamic uh, and, and, again, led a campaign for fair employment, got involved in the political arena, even built some fleeting early coalitions with Mexican Americans in the city, led by an attorney named John J. Herrera, uh, who was a, a part of a fairly militant LULAC chapter in, the, in that city, the League of United Latin American Citizens. Then there's another individual I get into named Chris Dixie, who is a leader of the white liberal Democrats in Houston. Uh, he's a plaintiff's lawyer. He's got a great long story. You know, he, um, he was a child of Greek immigrants who had a restaurant and they had a long Greek name, but they ended up buying this restaurant called the Dixie Cafe. And so they, they changed their last name to Dixie. And so the son became Chris Dixie and he, uh, you know, went to law school and became uh, part of uh, a uh, uh, sort of network of labor and plaintiff side lawyers who were really the backbone of, of that liberal wing of, of the white Democratic Party in this period. Uh, so they get organized in the 40s and into the 50s. They form a group called the Harris County Democrats that um, uh, allows them to push for and ultimately take over the uh, local party machinery, taking it away from the conservatives, you know, in the name of liberalism, in the name of bringing that, those New Deal ideas to Texas finally after the war. Um, and uh, uh, they have their greatest success at, at the statewide level in um, pushing for uh, a gubernatorial candidate who eventually becomes U.S. Senator Ralph Yarborough. Um, and so it's that Houston chapter that re leads that push really at the statewide level through a group called the Democrats of Texas. Um, so we see a growing what they called the liberal movement in the 1950s. So there's this, there's a black civil rights movement in Houston and elsewhere um, that goes through some changes with the onset of the Cold War, but, but does survive. Uh, and then there's a, uh, the white liberal movement. Of course, there's labor everywhere in this picture in the background and uh, different people who are connected to labor in different ways. So the other two legs, so I got African-Americans, I got um, the white liberals. Um, Mexican-American civil rights movement really takes off after World War II and, and much of the book focuses on that story in San Antonio. Uh, as a, a, and the guide is, is a man named Albert Pena, who is a lawyer, a civil rights attorney, um, who becomes a political activist. And, and Albert Pena is an amazing story. You know, he was a, a veteran, uh, served in World War II, um, comes back, goes to law school, and he becomes an attorney in San Antonio. And he joins the American GI Forum, which is this uh, civil rights group composed of Mexican-American veterans. Um, and they're basically pushing, again, for, for, for basic services, right? They're trying to get the welfare state extended to Mexican-Americans. They're trying to fight discrimination against Mexican-Americans. They're trying to desegregate schools so that Mexican-Americans can get a better quality education. Um, he also joins the LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. Um, but in, in, you know, in both, both cases, he kind of learns that their traditional ways of doing things aren't working very well, that just fighting these cases in court doesn't necessarily produce the change he wants to see. Um, he gets calls from parents in nearby cities outside of San Antonio asking for help. He files lawsuits on their behalf and, and nothing happens. And, and so in one case, I think it was in Hondo, um, you know, the school year is rolling around, it's the mid 1950s, and, um, and the parents get very upset, right? They say, why, why hasn't the school done anything yet? Why haven't they responded to our case? 
And so, and they get mad at Pena. Why aren't you, you know, doing a better job at advocating our cause? So Pena goes down there and, um, and comes up with the idea of instead of waiting on the lawsuit, they just go into the main building and try to register their kids and, and at, at the white school. And they form a line and when they get rejected, they go to the back of the line and they keep trying to register on the first day of school. And what that does is it gums up the works. And so Anglo families are not able to register their students and the school's unable to open. The, the, the district reaches out to TEA and gets uh, some advice and TEA says, well, the courts have decided you have to let them in. Uh, even though the widespread practice was that districts were not doing that. Uh, and so the same day, the school was integrated, right? Um, so Pena learns that through direct action and through political change, he can move the struggle ahead even, even faster. He also begins organizing in the political arena. Um, they, they build a group called the Loyal American Democrats, which is a Mexican-American liberal democratic club in, in San Antonio. Um, and they are able to bring a presidential candidate to the, to the barrios of the West Side for the first time in their history. Adelaide Stevenson comes to the city in 1952. And um, in 1953, they help elect Henry B. Gonzalez to the city council, his first political office. Of course, he goes on to become a senator and a congressman for many years, uh, a state senator and then a con U.S. congressman. Uh, and in 1956, Pena himself is elected to the Bear County Commissioner's Court. Uh, and that's a major breakthrough for the first time an independent, you know, liberal-minded Mexican-American has this position of formal power and influence in San Antonio. Uh, and really, he uses that as a springboard to build a statewide network of Mexican-American political activists, um, you know, jumping on the Viva Kennedy bandwagon in 1960 to help elect John F. Kennedy to the presidency. And then after that, forming a group called the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations, or PASO. And, um, and so PASO becomes the, the organized Mexican-American political uh, body in the state. Um, and Pena is its chairman and the leader of a, a liberal and pro-labor faction within it that come to, over time to steer the, the, the organization. Um, the last piece is organized labor itself. Um, organized labor, of course, in Texas is not very strong today and people don't often know much about it. But in the 1950s, it represented roughly one in six industrial workers in the state. Union density was around 17%, just shy of 17%. So it had a much bigger influence on Texas culture uh, and certainly on the Texas workplace and politics. Um, that said, most of the organized workers were white. Uh, the union leadership was predominantly white. Um, there was a mix of, of old CIO industrial unions and even older AFL craft unions that tended to be um, very conservative, I guess, in their outlook um, and almost completely filled with in the ranks with white men. And then there were the, some of the industrial unions which were much more diverse, the oil workers, the steel workers um, in, in places like Houston. Um, and, uh, and, and then there were places where African-Americans and Mexican-Americans carved out power within the labor movement, uh, such as on the docks, uh, uh, the waterfronts, the railroad unions, even though they were, might be segregated, they were sources of, of black power and, and Latino power within the labor movement. Um, that aside, in the 1950s, labor remained um, fairly traditional and fairly uh, for, for the sort of Southern labor movement of the 50s. Um, you know, the, uh, the former radical wings of the movement had long since been purged and, um, and many African-Americans and Mexican-American workers rightly pointed to labor as a, a, another source of the problem rather than the solution, right? As a, a, a group that might sometimes defend discrimination at the workplace, even though they recognized that, that the, it was the bosses, the employers who really decided who to hire and what capacity. All that to say that in the 1950s, labor um, was a, a potent part of the white liberal democratic wing of the party, but it was that, it was white, it was liberal in its orientation, um, and it, its commitment to civil rights was not terribly strong. Um, that changes in the 1960s with the arrival of, a, of new leadership. And essentially what happens is in, the, in the, 19, the later 1950s in San Antonio, Albert Pena gets together with local African-American activists and with local labor leaders and they form a, a local coalition called the Bear County Democratic Coalition. And the local labor leader is a plumber named Hank Brown. 
and Brown ultimately becomes the president of the Texas AFL-CIO, and he brings that model and that experience to the statewide level and helps to orient the state labor movement uh, away from its past and toward a new future of embracing the civil rights struggle as a, as a path to achieving its own ends. Um, so by the time the Democratic Coalition forms in the 1960s, those are the elements. Hank Brown calls the meeting along with Albert Pena, uh, and they bring African-American activists from all over the state, Mexican-American activists from all over the state, labor union members from all over the state who are mostly white, and then the white independent liberals, the plaintiffs, lawyers, and others who have joined the different democratic clubs. And their goal is to um, take over the machinery of the state party, right? To, to wrest the control of it away from the conservative Dixiecrats, to elect more liberals like Senator Yarborough to positions of, of power and authority, uh, including at the local level, people like Albert Pena. Um, and then, uh, the, the, the question, I guess, that emerges is to what extent are they, are they committed to fighting Jim Crow and Juan Crow racism? To what extent is civil rights part of their agenda? And initially the answer is not much, but I show in the book how over time uh, Black and Latino members of the coalition push it to become a, a fierce supporter of the civil rights struggle and really a civil rights organization in its own, in its own right. It's great. Yeah. So we've got the four legs you mentioned, uh, African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, white liberals and labor uh, all coming together. Um, it sounds like they all kind of had their own uh, issues. And I imagine all of them coming together was a bit of a struggle in some ways. Um, could you, I guess, elaborate a little bit on, on their coalition, how it worked, and um, maybe some more on what their disagreements and then eventually similarities were. Sure, okay, good, yeah. So people sometimes assume that different groups that are oppressed will come together just because they have similar histories of oppression, right? Um, the historical record doesn't bear that out, right? Um, to the extent that groups do come together, it, it requires uh, a tremendous heavy lift. They, you know, they start from, from separate communities. They live often in different neighborhoods. Uh, they have different cultures, sometimes languages, religions, disparate leaders, uh, diverging priorities, right? There's all sorts of differences between all of those four groups. Um, each of them are in it uh, on their own and for their own ends, right? Um, African Americans in the, in, that do join the coalition tend to be the, the more liberal, the more left-leaning, the more pro-labor African Americans uh, who, who are activists. Um, but their, their main goal is integration. They want immediate integration and they want economic justice, access to jobs. Um, for Mexican Americans, they have a, a, a completely separate history, right? Um, both, and they're kind of clustered in different parts of the state, different parts of cities. Um, but they likewise were struggling for civil rights, uh, for integration, for labor rights, uh, end, to, end to discrimination. Uh, but it meant very different things in their context. Um, one of the things I show in the book is that even though Mexican Americans were legally classified as white in the 1950s, that legal status meant very little to them. Uh, and in fact, these movements really emerge as a, a sort of self-conscious ethnic minority organizing as an ethnic minority. Um, you know, Pena would often compare themselves to Irish or other groups that in the past had organized in their own interest and um, not to become white, but to gain basic civil rights and inclusion. Um, and, and so they, th those were some differences, right? Um, and then each of those communities were internally divided as well, right? So there were distinctions of class, of strategy, of tactics, of political philosophy, um, ideology, a million different divisions um, that internally separated African-Americans from each other and, and, and Mexican Americans within their communities. Um, and so a lot of what I show in the book are those internal disagreements, the battles within black communities over who will lead and on what terms and what their agenda would be. Uh, the battles within PASO, the Mexican American organization over what their, what their approach to forming alliances with other groups should be. You know, one wing of PASO said, no way, we don't wanna ally with labor. We're not all that interested in working with African Americans either. Uh, but the Pena group and the group that ultimately wins out is the group that says, no, in order to build our power and accomplish our goals, 
We have to form alliances with African Americans. We have to commit ourselves 100% to the black civil rights struggle. We have to tie ourselves to labor. Um, and, and so that was an internal debate. You know, within the labor movement, there's internal debates about how much to, to fight on the civil rights front, how much to worry about the fate of Mexican American and black workers who were often seen as, as um, difficult to organize and, and they weren't well understood by the leaders of organized labor. So a coalition happens, to get to your question, a coalition happens when groups from different places come together, right? And they, they, they have separate houses, as Bernice Johnson Reagan put it, um, and the house is their home place, the, the, the part where they start, uh, where they're with people who are basically like-minded, um, you know, other folks who probably look like them, but certainly have that, there's a set of, you know, political affinities and, and cultural affinities pulling them together. And the coalition occurs when they go and get together with someone who's different from them, right? And often, um, that, I think that always, that always entails difference. <laughs> Uh, it always entails a, a process of having to get to know one another and hammer out differences and figure out how to work together despite those differences rather than trying to erase them, right? And um, so each of the four groups I mentioned came into this democratic coalition with their own goals in mind. Um, they were all somewhat suspicious of the other members. The early meetings tended to not go well. <laughs> people yelled at each other, people stormed out. Um, you know, there are all kinds of hiccups along the way. Um, but over time, that mutual suspicion and distrust gets replaced with new bonds of, of reciprocity uh, and eventually of trust and, and solidarity. And, um, and it, it's not orderly, it's not teleological, um, it's up and down. There's a chapter in the book called Fits and Starts that show these, these efforts made in these different areas that then blow up in their faces. Um, so to give just one example, uh, in, in the early 60s, the coalition held a meeting in a segregated hotel in Austin. Um, and so the African -Amer American members of the coalition rightly pointed out that this was no way to have a meeting about expanding democracy in their state, right? That how could they expect to conquer segregation if they couldn't even uh, remove it from their own ranks? If they were forced to take the freight elevator into the ballroom along with the service staff. Um, and so there was a lot of debate about that. There was a lot of debate um, at that same meeting from African Americans who talked about the violence that people faced for even trying to vote in, in rural areas um, or even putting up a sign in support of a campaign. People might lose their jobs. Like the, the circumstances facing your average African American who it might be interested in politics might become a voter were, were very different than those facing a white working person in a union who had a lot of protections. And they had to make that clear uh, through the process of these meetings. Um, you know, Mexican Americans often were treated in Texas with you know, discrimination, treated as non-white, barred access to restaurants, barred access to schools, prohibited from voting. But in other cases, they could walk through the front door of that hotel, just depending on the exact situation and what clothes they were wearing and how light their skin might be. So there was a million different things that each group's working out internally and then with each other. But the most important piece, the key, is that over time these different activists learned experientially that they had in some ways more in common with people who looked differently from them but shared their politics and their style and their tactics and their ideology. They had more in common across the color line sometimes than they did with their own uh, co-ethnic people of their same racial groups, right? So what we see in, is a, a process of separation where the most militant activists, the most liberal activists among African-Americans and Mexican-Americans separate themselves from their more conservative, more um, middle-class, more uh, politically um, uh, cautious so-called race leaders. Right? There was a debate about the approach to power um, within each group. And so for Albert Pena, for, for his counterpart in San Antonio, an undertaker named G.J. Sutton, for people like uh, Moses Leroy, um, they were in interested in building independent political power for their communities. And some of their antagonists were black and, and brown leaders who instead were okay with diplomacy and patronage and forming alliances with conservatives. Um, so th those were the debates, right? And so the coalition brings together these disparate forces. It does not erase difference, but allows people to work together across difference. And the way we see that manifested in the Democratic coalition initially is that the one thing that they can all agree to work together on is voter registration. 
that's the that's the non-controversial item they can agree upon. Um, and particularly a registration drive targeting African Americans and Mexican Americans as well as white union people. Um, but there had never been um, a coordinated voter registration drive in this manner. So that was a, itself a signal accomplishment. And and the way it worked was in back in these days with the poll tax, voters had to pay a uh, dollar seventy five to register, to pay their poll tax and register to vote. And they had to do it every year. And it was due by January 31st. And that's what determined if you got to participate in politics the rest of the year uh, in voting. Um, so there was this huge coordinated camp, the Democratic Coalition in 61, 62, and again, 62, 63, launched these large coordinated uh, voter registration drives. Actually, the first ones were a little smaller. And then by 63, they're able to build on that in 64 into a much larger coordinated campaign that they called Project Vote, Voters of Texas Enlist. Uh, and under Project Vote, they hired literally dozens of organizers to go out and, and do registration and political education work in African-American and, and Mexican-American communities. So um, how did the civil rights movement influence the political movement that you're describing in your book? Uh, I imagine there's some um, elements of a grassroots movement and tactics that were probably similar between the two things? Yeah, I mean, the distinctions are hard to make sometimes even. Um, you know, civil rights was the backdrop. It was the background for the entire, um, the entire political story I'm telling, that African Americans, um, you know, they're, they're engaging in politics in the service of the civil rights movement, right? It's not an end in itself. Mm -hmm. And likewise for Mexican Americans. Um, you know, for, for whites, they could divorce the two a little bit early on. You know, even Ralph Yarborough, the great liberal white senator, um, after the Little Rock desegregation crisis begins, Yarborough give, gave a statement that said that he was against the forced commingling of the races, which was very much a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, deferring to uh, Southern segregation. And black activists in Texas slammed him for it, right? They didn't like that at all. And it took many years, actually, to rebuild some trust between Yarborough and some of the activists who, who took note of that. On the flip side, what we see taking place is as African-Americans and Mexican-Americans experiment in other tactics, they're able to, I guess, increase um, their clout, improve their hand, their bargaining power within the coalition. So in 1960 in Texas, there are sit-ins in every, every major city and many smaller cities, right? Just like, uh, you know, the first sit-in happens in Greensboro in 1960, February 1st. Um, by March, there's sit-ins in Houston, right? Uh, eventually Dallas, uh, San Antonio, Austin, Marshall. Uh, I mean, all over the state, there uh, black activists are taking the street and sitting in. And in Houston, you know, the, the young activists who, who, who lead the charge are, are accompanied by some of the older generation folks like Mo, Moses Leroy. Um, and he's, he's there helping them and participating and other black working folks um, from the struggle in Houston are also part of that student led movement. Um, in San Antonio, there's sit-ins um, by the African-American NAACP Youth Council uh, and others that are attached to Mr. Sutton and Reverend Black and others who were leaders of this older generation of activists who have been you know, moving since the 1930s. Um, in fact, in San Antonio, there was even a Mexican-American group that was staging stand-ins at the movie theaters uh, and in Austin mixed groups of blacks and whites that were fighting uh, to desegregate the movie theaters. So all of that politics, all of that protest on the ground the politics of the streets actually has an impact on the on the rest of the of the political um, field, and what it means is that by the time as the Democratic coalition keeps going through meeting after meeting, you know over time, the white folks realize they have to take the black and Latino folks more seriously. They have to listen to them. They're they're the ones who are out on the front lines. They're the ones who are pioneering new ways of building power. Um, they're the ones who are connecting the electoral arena with the everyday lives of ordinary people, right? And get activating new folks because they're showing them why politics is, is relevant to them. Same thing happens with Mexican Americans in uh, South Texas. In 1963, Albert Pena and Paso 
form an alliance with the local Teamsters Union and with student activists in Crystal City, Texas, in, in Safala County, the Winter Garden region, you know, an hour and a half, two hours southwest of San Antonio. And this is a small town hamlet um, that at the time had been dominated by white Anglo uh, agricultural interests really since it had been settled, right? Even though it was a majority Mexican American city. And so this coalition succeeds in registering so many Mexicanos that they are able to uh, elect a full slate of city council members in 1963. Um, and it becomes known as the, the Crystal City Revolt or the first revolt of the Chicano movement. Um, this group of ordinary folks, right? The, the mayor was a, a business agent for the union. Um, and they become the new elected leadership in Crystal City. Now, they didn't do anything radical, right? All they were saying was, we're the majority, we should get to vote. And if we want to vote somebody in who represents us better, we should do that. <laughs> um, but the white power structure took notice, right? Um, in fact, the, you know, the governor sent the Texas Rangers in to intimidate people who were involved in that campaign. Uh, a lot of Mexicanos lost their jobs or were otherwise facing reprisals uh, for participating in that movement. But for PASO, for Albert Pena, for the statewide coalition, this was a, a shot across the bow. This was an opportunity to demonstrate what their model could look like, what it would mean to go out and do mass registrations and how transformative that could be politically. And once again, you know, the, the other wings of the coalition supported them and came to realize this, this is the future. We need, to, we need to back up Pena and Paso. We need to back up black civil rights activists and really commit ourselves to that. So in August of 1963, August 28th, and the same day as the March on Washington, there's a March on Austin. And the, the march is led by local Austin people and, and a man named Booker T. Bonner. And um, something like a, you know, a, as many as a thousand uh, young people, mostly black, marched from East Austin uh, past the Capitol and Governor's Mansion and held a rally in a nearby park. Um, and, it, and it was a massive demonstration but even more revealing was the people who were there, right? So in, in addition to these young local teenagers and, and, and college students, um, there were members of the Democratic Coalition, black, white, Latino of all ages from all over the state. And when they get together to have their rally at the end, um, you know, the lead speaker is, is a leader of the coalition, a man named W.J. Durham from from Dallas, a longtime attorney. Actually, he was one of the attorneys that brought the, the sweat case along with Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall of the NAACP, uh, had been a voting rights activist and political activist there for decades. So W.J. Durham goes to this rally and says, you know, today is a new day. They will never separate, as he said, the Negroes and Latin Americans again in politics. They'll never separate Negro and labor again in politics. They'll never separate Negroes from independent white men, liberals in politics. You know, he said, we're gonna, we're gonna pray on the streets. We're gonna work in the streets. He said, we're going to march to the ballot box, um, and that's the message I have to give to my governor. I think I messed up the exact quotation a little, but you get the idea, right? That um, this was a moment in which the coalition really flexed its muscle as a multiracial alliance, you know, dedicated to liberal political victories, but also wholly invested in the civil rights movement. By this time, organized labor had come out 100% in support of integration. The movement... Um, the, the marchers carried signs that said freedom now. They were demanding immediate, complete integration by statute, right, rather than some of the voluntary and gradual measures that were being advocated by others uh, elsewhere in the state, including the governor, Governor John Connolly. So, um, you know, it was the marriage of civil rights protest with traditional electioneering that gave the coalition its power and its reach. Um, and I think that makes it worth um, studying still today. So can I guess as a um, finishing up a little bit, what were some of the big successes um, of the coalition in terms of their, you know, legislative or, or governance or anything like that? And then, and when did they, or when did it dissolve? Yeah. Well, the coalition in some ways was short lived. As I mentioned, it started in 1961. It, it evolved in fits and starts it really hits its peak at that moment in, in 63 and into 64. And, um, and they built up this thing called Project Vote, Voters of Texas Enlist. Um, I think their greatest accomplishment is that campaign itself, that they were able to go out and register 
um, huge numbers of people. I mean, they built a, 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 a what they called an army of volunteer block walkers, uh, block workers, block captains. Some, you know, probably around 10,000 volunteers joined their network. And each of them were responsible for going out and talking to personally and registering and turning out to vote 20 voters in their neighborhood. So, we're, I mean, that's a huge effort, unlike anything that had been seen before or that would be seen for decades. I think the only thing now that has uh, replicated it might be Beto O'Rourke's campaign in 2018. Um, but this was the first and the, the widest spread effort to reach deep into the inner cities and into rural areas to, rep to, to organize African Americans and Mexican Americans. Um, as I mentioned, they hired a staff that was entirely composed of African Americans and Mexican Americans people who they trained and who then went out and trained people in their community on how political action worked. Um, they recruited and, and trained, you know, truly a generation of political leadership in the state, um, including, you know, there, there were folks who, who they tapped into or who tapped into them, they partnered with. You know, one organizer who was one of the, the local directors in Houston was a woman named Barbara Jordan, right, who goes on to become herself a member of Congress, right? And a state senator beginning in 66. Um, so they're, they're, um, they, they, I think you can make the case that they permanently changed the map of Texas politics by organizing in these places and building the capacity of those communities. Uh, they broke open the Democratic Party. It took them a little longer than they thought it would, but um, you know, the transition that we've seen uh, where the parties are now you know, predominantly people of color living in the cities like that they they pushed through it wasn't it wasn't natural it wasn't inevitable they literally broke down the doors they, <laughs> the white democrats didn't want them there and they came and and over time took over um, and made that party a party that stood for many of of their issues um, you know so i think those are two really big lasting changes they also continued to support civil rights activism on the ground in different ways so in 64 they re-elect ralph yarborough um, they helped elect President Johnson uh, to a, another term. Um, they actually accomplished a lot in terms of legislative races, uh, in terms of local elections, so much so that the legislature that emerges, um, you know, in the next few years, in 65 and again in 67, are some of the most liberal legislatures in Texas history. Uh, they were able to pass things like workers' comp over the next couple of sessions. By 66, it's dead. The coalition ceases to exist as it had previously, but the people keep organizing, right? And, and in a variety of different ways. And I do think that there's a permanent transformation of the state's political culture. At the same time, right, those activists did not accomplish what they set out to accomplish, right? They didn't check all the items off their list. There was a lot of work that remained unfinished and that remains unfinished today. But I think that the, the model of the coalition in terms of bringing these different groups together allowing them to work through differences without erasing them, uh, giving, you know, providing um, ways for coordinated campaigns across lines of difference. Uh, you know, they, they really offer a blueprint for the future uh, at the same time that they, you know, help us to better understand the past. All right. Well, thanks so yeah. much for your time. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. All right. Thank you.